Hello and welcome to the Lutheran Institute of Regenerative Agriculture's webinar series here in 2023. We've recorded two of them so far this year, one with uh, chiropractor Brent Boltemeyer on nutrition and health. Last uh, time, a couple weeks ago, we spoke with Rory Groves, a farmer up in southern Minnesota, and he talked about uh, we talked about rural America. We talked about stewardship of the land. We talked about uh, the trades with him. And now today, as our third podcast or third webinar of of the new year, we are glad to have joining us Del Fike. He is the co-founder of Graze Master Group, and I'll let him explain what that is here in a little bit. A farmer uh, near Pleasantdale, Nebraska. I should probably introduce myself now too. Uh, my name is Pastor Christopher Morundi. I serve as the director of the Lutheran Institute of Regenerative Agriculture, and it is my joy to bring to you all these voices. And we keep schedule. I just scheduled a new webinar uh, today, so we we keep bringing on these new voices for you to hear, and hopefully, hopefully you enjoy these webinars and you share them with your friends and so on and so forth. So we're going to do this in two parts. We'll record this part and then uh, then we'll record another part about 20, 25, 30 minutes each. And we'll drop one on uh, Monday and one on Tuesday. So definitely tune in for both. We'll be hitting different topics on each of them. Well, Dell, thank you very much for being with us today. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. Uh, Dell's been a wonderful friend of Lyra and uh, a wonderful connection that we've made. And I'll, that'll become apparent as the as our conversation goes on. Uh, Dell, give, give us a little bit of your biography, your background. What what got you into this this whole gig of uh, of agriculture in general, but but particularly the the quote unquote regenerative sphere? Uh, what kind of got you into all that? What's your what's your path? Well, there's, there's really only two ways that you get into regenerative agriculture. Um, it's either you have it in your heart or you have to. And so uh, I think I was a little bit of both, but certainly more of the, you know, I, I come to the, the epiphany of we're doing a lot of things wrong not just not just everyone around i was doing a lot of things wrong too and needed to change you know what i was doing not only for the health of the soil but the health of the family and community and and uh, the longevity um, and also the resurgence of the small town that um you know i'm old enough that i got to see the the vibrancy in the small towns as a kid and I got to see him go away. And so I would really like to see him come back to at least some vibrancy. Um, and so my path's been a big, big journey of a lot of mistakes. And also a lot of things that um, I think we got right, or we're getting right, or, you know, I, I can't tell people what to do, but I can tell them what not to do. And I think that's just as important as, uh, you know, maybe reading that, that uh, crystal ball and, you know, maybe you should do this or maybe you shouldn't. But I know what not to do and what works, you know, in, in many areas across the country, if not most all of them. We've been to a lot of them through our, through our pilgrimage here. And so the Grays Master Group was a a offshoot after about uh, eight or 10 years of consulting on regenerative practices. And just like, you know, we'd had enough of everyone saying that we needed to do something different, but yet there wasn't resources to go out there and uh, necessarily talk to people or find different products or do things in a manner that um, was conducive to healthy soil and healthy families and things like that. So, I had a long stint in a pretty large-esque uh, farming operation that was conventional that we went no-till way back in the day before most people did. Um, but God also had different plans for me. Um, in 1999, I had several back surgeries, and it changed the course 
of what I was doing. And it allowed me to finally go to college and, and <clears throat> do some things different and ended up in the medical field, which, which taught me a lot and then worked for a nonprofit here in Nebraska that helped farmers and ranchers with disabilities. Um, I did that for several years and uh, got into a little bit of the corporate ag side, which was enough to know or to tell me that that was not the direction I wanted to go or the direction any of us should go. Um, that truly had a desire to make things better. So that was a long answer to a short question. Sure. sure. And, and so what what does the Graze Master Group do? What, what to, So you talked about consulting. Um, it, take us through what what uh, what does your team do? What does your team look like? Uh, you, you go to your website, and I'll be putting the link up to your website on uh, underneath the show here and on our blog and that sort of thing. Uh, you, you contact, you take a look at that, that uh, page where you have all the pictures of different people. What, how, how have you collected them together? What's the goals? How do you go about things? Well, we're we're very particular on who we bring on board. Um, you know, we don't want any duplication. If we've got one person um, in an area, that's the specialist we want, and we're not going to put two in there. Uh, Carrie Hofstar and I really started the the Jess of Grace Mass Group was started a long time ago. Uh, 2015, I trademarked my breed of cattle here that we call Grace Masters. And then we use that name, kind of the same philosophy of, hey, if we can build a breed of cattle that work any place, we can put a group of people together that uh, they are specialists in a lot of different areas to help everyone in agriculture. So yeah, when you go to those that page and see all those people, um, you know, we've got Nate Belcher's Hybrid 85, Cover Crop Exchange, Kirk Peterson, Vance Hire. They're on the financial side. Ward Laboratories in Kearney, one of the largest um, labs in the world. They're a Grace Master partner. We've got a community builder. We've got a uh, people nutrition person now. We've got cattle experts. And then just recently, we uh, got signed on with... Uh, or one of the largest hemp contractors and growers in the country signed on with us. And uh, so we, we want to have the best resources for people. We want to have these people that are genuinely committed to doing the same thing we're doing, you know, building communities, building families, building soil. Uh, we, we do not um, shy away from, from that because that's our core. And uh, I truly believe I've, I've had a calling in this. Um, could even take you back to when that calling um, came into my life. My grandfather that I spent much, much of my time with, a naturalist. And he, he came to me one Sunday morning and, and uh, he had been gone a long time. And he said, you're not the first, you're not the best but you're the most vocal and you're the most persistent person for this and you need to do it. So, you know, it's kind of like, dang grandpa, you know, I like, I, I didn't need anything else to, to do let, let alone jump on such a large, really a large scale problem with a lot of opportunities, but it's agriculture is a huge problem. Um, and, uh, you know, the communities and families are a symptom of that problem that uh, is, is kind of metastasized into a, uh, a bigger problem than I think a lot of people can understand. So I, I was very intrigued by what you said about the connection between healthy soil and healthy communities. Do you want to kind of take us through that? How does, how does unhealthy soil lead to unhealthy communities? And then on the other hand, how can you rebuild healthy communities through healthy soil? Now, I, I, I think that's something that maybe for a lot of folks is that, that there's a little disconnect there, but I, 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 I think there's a, there's a wonderful connection. I'd like to see you unpack that a little bit. So I'm a firm believer if we get the soil right, we change all of society for the better. We are from an agrarian base. We all came from the soil, the soil that God put on this earth in a very perfect way. Even the, the craziest desert regions now were 
fertile soil thousands of years ago that that man uh, depleted. Unfortunately, a lot of great civilizations have depleted their resources, soil, water, things like that, and they're no more. They're history. Uh, the U.S. is, I, I think the U.S. probably holds a record for depleting soil and contaminating water faster than any other civilization on Earth, which is not a great record to have. Um, but there is a direct correlation between healthy soils and healthy people, healthy food, healthy communities. If, if everyone can touch the soil, it's spiritual, it's medicinal. Um, I'm not a soil scientist, I'm a soil romantic. Mm -hmm. And um, which is a, a, a much better place to be than uh, I, I can have, I can philosophy, have more philosophy and less um, worrying about those cumbersome data sets that universities put together that bore everybody. I, I want to get people engaged. I want them to understand that um, when we do get that right, it does all change. And you know, our food system shot are, are because of our soil and because of the things we put on it. And, um, you know, it's nothing but opportunity, but it's also going to take a lot of hard work. And the people that, uh, you know, are getting it and understanding it are really going to change this thing for the better. And when we get to talk to those people every day, we're, we're very blessed. I don't need to to go chase around people that are going to argue every step of the way with how we're going to change it because there's people, you know, lining up that want to do the right thing. And so we have to, we have to serve those people that are ready. Um, and uh, those other people will come around if they have it in their heart or if they have to, they'll come around to it. It's just, you know, the, the, the British say that we've got 60 harvests left. We don't have that many harvests left. And we've probably got 30 harvests left in this country as as fast as we're depleting the soil. So when you look at, you've got dirt and you got soil. Dirt doesn't smell, soil smells beautiful. And um, so we, we, we need to take what, what God gave us in our hands as, as much as we can, because like I say, it's healing and, uh, you know, the, all, all those healthy microbes in that soil are supposed to be the same healthy microbes in our gut. And um, when you get those all right, it makes a huge difference. God did not make any mistakes with us. We screwed it all up. Yeah, I, 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 we're going to have the um, in church on Sunday, the the account of Genesis three. Uh, I guess for those of you who are watching, it'll be the, the day before you see this video. But uh, the 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 ground was cursed in adam's fall and we've just that's <laughs> that's both you know an event that happened in genesis 3 and then also something that we've contributed with as we as we move forward um as a, a one of the neat things and and certainly any christian who does adventure or business doesn't have to have a cross on their logo i mean that, that's not it's not required but certainly on the gray's master logo there's there's a cross um, and that that indicates that uh, that that there's something more going on here than just, you know, preserving the human race for the sake of the human race. There's something there, there's a there's a reason deeper for what you're doing, what why you're doing what you're doing uh, than than simply uh, altruism, that there, there's something spiritual here, too. Uh, how do you think through these things as a Christian? What what uh, what effect does your Christian faith, and I, I don't know if you want to drill even further down as a Lutheran, but uh, but certainly as a Christian, how does this, uh, a, how does this intersect? What, what, uh, what, how do you approach this as a Christian? Well, I, I think if you, um, going back to that you know that cross in our logo uh when carrie hofstein and i put that together it it was very near and dear to both of us that that was in there you know i'm nothing but a sinner and a beggar and i do everything wrong um 
but I, I have a great understanding of uh, the genesis of where things started and how we've got to them and how we need to change them. So I, I was in Alabama last week at a cattle conference uh, talking about the Graze Master Group and carbon sequestration, all the stuff we're doing. Um, and a guy come up to me and he goes, he was showing me a picture of my logo and he goes, he's pointing to the cross and he said, I want to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you can be, you know, it's, uh, and he goes, well, you know, if you've got that on your logo, just like you said, you know, it has to mean something. <clears throat> I am, I am past, um, the, I, I, I'm not a good Christian, but I'm a, I'm a Christian. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm past the, the different, you know, the, the, the political side of religion, you know, as even though I'm, I'm Lutheran, um, I really, my, my, my God is, is, uh, that, that created beautiful things like we've all learned since we were little and, um, and really tied it into how we can make this great for everybody. <clears throat> so my faith on the Christianity side, very strong, very strong. That cross is there for a reason because, you know, um, I'm not here or I'm only here because of, you know, what was done before me through all that. And, and, and definitely I feel like, you know, I, I'm, I'm taking that cross in, in a different level so people can understand that you can you can be maybe not the the a student <laughs> religiously and still be a beautiful christian and understand um you know the, the good things with it so that the cross is bigger than than a lot of things that i i think of you know locally or anything like that but it's it's extremely important in our mission because without it we we wouldn't be here just like the you know I, I talk about the garden um and our friend pastor bloom he always is like dell you're going to bring the garden back well i'm trying but i said you have to remember that garden was most likely 100 percent not in straight rows <laughs> it was full of every kind of plant including weeds that weren't weeds back then that man named weeds later um the, the the garden most likely was a very beautiful place of of plants that we hope we get to see again someday but it's not you know we tend to europeanize it in straight rows or you know beautifully neat tucked confines of how we think it should look um you know i tell a lot of people that the best cover crop on earth is weeds <laughs> you know god doesn't like a nudist colony <laughs> bare soil weeds come for a reason and it's not a mistake and they are telling us something and they can be very nutritious for animals and they can be very good for building the soil um so now now we'll get you know people throwing rocks at us yet on um, because we're talking about the, the the beauty of weeds but <laughs> god made no mistakes he made no mistakes in this. We just happen as human beings just happen to be the dumbest animal that he put on earth. And uh, we try every day to make it better. So how do you, um, and, and we'll, and we'll, when we get to our second episode, folks, we'll, we're going to talk about more technique. Well, this is kind of more the philosophy episode. And then the, the next one, we'll talk a little bit more nuts and bolts about, about how we actually pull this off. What was actually look like on the ground? How, how do you, how do you convince folks? And this was a conversation I think you and I had the very first time we talked. How do you, how do you make that case? How do you how do you convince? Uh, I, I had someone ask me that the other day. They said, "Well, how, what do you say to the to the seventy year old farmer who's been doing uh, quote unquote conventional farming his entire life, 
what, how do you talk to them? And I said, well, that's a great question. Ask Dell um, <laughs> because he's done it. I mean, that's, that's what you do for a living uh, through the Graze Master Group. So, so take us through that here in, the, here in our last bit here on our first half of our webinar. Well, and I, I hate to say it, but I, I think that the doubters and, and naysayers have, have drug me down and maybe wore me out a little bit more than I like to, uh, like to admit. Um, I, I really, really changed my, my mindset on, on really targeting those people or talking to those people that want to change. But we come across doubters. We come across these people all the time. You know, if they're old enough, I always approach it as, do you remember when, say, your dad or grandfather frost-seeded red clover into wheat? And, and they'll be like, well, yeah, they did that for, for nitrogen, for fertilizer. And boy, it made good feed then. And I'm like, so how did we get away from that? well, you just couldn't make a living doing that. I said, well, who, who said you couldn't, you know, everyone followed a path of, <clears throat> excuse me, of get big, get out, farm fence row to fence row, you know, government policy really messed it up for the American farmer. Like they mess up so many things. Um, but, you know, when you talk to these older people and you say, you know, I almost use the, the thought process of you know better you've got to see it when it was better everything is cyclical everything has been done you know and everything comes around and there I, i'd much rather talk to somebody that's 75 than somebody that's 50 40 or 55 like i'm 55 they're kind of right in that middle of we're getting kind of comfortable might be working with dad and graph they're kind of making the decisions whatever you know they're a harder nut to crack and people areas make a difference too there's there's areas that it would it would be a waste of my breath to try to convince them to do something different because the system even though it's broken in those areas is still very financially um, satisfying for them so if, if you're on top of a bunch of water or if you're in the middle of one of those ice states that has a lot of black soil, you know, and, and uh, where maybe you don't have to change as much as the guy in eastern Montana or, um, you know, central Kansas or, you know, you, we kind of all ended up where we ended up, but it's really made our minds different in um, the urgency to change and the urgency to make things better because it was so tied into the longevity of the operation that if you didn't change in those hard scrabble areas, you weren't there. Mm -hmm. the, you know, you ceased to exist. And I didn't really answer your question on how we approach it. It, it really is each person is different. A first generation farmer that has, um, no preconceived notions and, and zero unlearning to do. Mm. It's like a elementary kid that you talk to about how we need to farm. They're like, oh, I get it. Everyone should farm that way. When you talk to somebody that's been stuck in it for a long time, they're resistant, change is hard. Um, you know, and, and, it's, it, and it's scary. You know, you take a huge, huge leap of faith when you go back to a very natural uh, type operation. And that faith, as you know way more than I do, that faith is there. We're just beat down or, you know, I, 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 I say farmers and ranchers suffer from the Stockholm syndrome. We become friends with our captors it's hard to get out of that type of jail in our minds. You know, the, the biggest hurdle in change in everything, not just agriculture, but especially in this, the biggest hurdle is between our ears. 
And the second biggest hurdle is in our heart. And when you bring those two together, and maybe the third deal is that kick in the seat of the pants of, hey, I'm I'm really losing money. I need to do something different. My soil's bad. It's washing away. It's blowing away. You know, I'm not raising anything. I'm putting more money into it, getting less out of it. Um, especially on the cattle side, where we really like to specialize in, those guys have never got a lot of handouts, you know, from the government or anything like that. And, um, you know, they're more independent. They're more, you know, there, there's still some romance left on, on, on that side of things, even though it's probably some crazy psychotic romance. It's still, it's still there, but your heart and mind has to be in the right place. And you have to have, you have to have faith really lined up in a, in biblical proportions of, we can do this because there's very few people um, and, and darn sure even fewer entities that are saying, just take that leap of faith. You know, we've got you, but it's, it's. God has us in this. He's He wants us to work, and we've got to see that. So we're we've been very blessed. Oh, wonderful! We have uh, been with uh, Del Fike. He is the co-founder of Graze Master Group, a uh, farmer near Pleasant Dale. I probably just said Pleasant Dale at the beginning, assuming everyone knew where Pleasant Dale was. Pleasant Dale, Nebraska. And uh, uh, we're very glad to have him with us. We I invite you to tune in. We'll be dropping the second half of our podcast uh, on uh, next Tuesday morning. So you hopefully you're watching this on Monday or else or else beyond. And then we'll drop the next one the next day on the next podcast, part two. So we encourage you to tune in. We'll be dealing with more uh, more nuts and bolts of what does regenerative agriculture look like? What kind of techniques does does Dell uh, recommend and guide and help people to to implement to heal the soil to, soil to do the kinds of things that we've been talking about in this first half of our webinar. Dell, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. All right, everyone, God's blessings and definitely tune in on the second half of our podcast.